Corinthians, just two verses. Although it's um, difficult and oftentimes, and I want every one of you, if you have a notebook or a pen or something, please write down some stuff today. Because what I have to say, young people, pay attention. Pay attention because each and every one of you will need the help that I'm going to provide today. Parents, pay attention because you need this help. Corinthians chapter 6 from the NIV says do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in help me you. in you, in you. so your the Holy Spirit is where in you Whom you have received from God. God. So it's in you. And we identify where it comes from. So it doesn't come from people laying their hands on you. Or knocking you over. Or tarrying at some place to receive it. It comes from God. You are... <laughs> Read that with me. You, you are, are not, not your, your own. own. Say, I am not my own. I am not my own. Say it again, please. I am not my own. You, you thought differently, didn't you? You are not your own. Also, you were bought at a price. At a price. I, I like the King James. And it says, you were bought with a price. With a price. At, at the price. Um, I don't know what the, exactly the distinctions are there, but I, I just prefer that. Um, therefore, do what? Honor God, Honor God. Honor God. Honor God. With, with your bodies. With your bodies. With what? Your bodies. Your bodies. So, so, this put our bodies in a very important place. Yes. And all the time you think your body was not important. Hello? You see, God places value upon the human body. I know we have been taught that the body, you know, um, is going to go, but um, you can't, if, 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 if it was only spirit in here, trust me, we wouldn't be worshipping today. We, we need some bodies in here. Yeah. You, you heard of the, 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 the professor who, um, his, 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 his class, one day he was late for class and um, when he arrived um, in, in his classroom, all the students are gone. And the next day he, 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 he spoke to them and said, um, didn't you see I, I left my hat here on the desk? Wherever my, my hat is, I, I am there also. So you got how comes you you guys left like that? My hat was there. So the next day when he came into class, he, he looked at the seats and there were all hats there. <laughs> <laughs> Bodies are important. Am I correct? Yes, boss. You know, one of the things that I try to do up here when I speak is to, to give you the historical context uh, whenever I can so that you really understand what the Word of God is all about. Now, if, if you're just satisfied with somebody just pulling a scripture and just shouting over it, um, this is not the place for you. But if you're really and truly interested in really um, digging deep and understanding what the Word of God is saying to you, I want you to pay close attention to, 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 to um, this historical context. In, I want you to note um, that the writer, first of all, of the, 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 the book of Corinthians, there is no doubt about that, 
um, uh, 1 Corinthians, no doubt, was the Apostle Paul. When we read uh, 1 Corinthians, it, it also seemed to indicate that actually 2 Corinthians was written before 1 Corinthians. How many of you knew that? So even though it says first, and when we hear the word first, we, we think, and it is lined up in the Bible that way. But actually, um, this um, first Corinthians seemed to have been written before second Corinthians. Why do we know that? It is because in, in, in first Corinthians, it tells us, that Paul had written a letter to them, a very painful letter to them, before he wrote this one. So he said, in the previous letter that I wrote to you, so obviously, um, 2 Corinthians probably was written because he, had, he dealt with some serious issues as well in, in 2 Corinthians. There's another theory to that too, in, in that some feel that probably there was another letter that was missing. Um, um, we don't know exactly, but we know that Paul had some, um, correspondence um, with the, the, the Corinthian church before. What was it about the city of Corinth? There was something about the city of Corinth. You see, in Paul's day, this city was a Roman colony and the capital of the province of Achaia. The population consisted of Roman citizens who had migrated from Italy, native Greeks, Jews, as is indicated in Acts 18 and verse 4, and other people from various places who chose to settle there. The ancient city enjoyed an ideal situation as a commercial center. So it was, it was the center of commerce. Like Atlanta and, and, and New York. Atlanta is fast becoming a center of commerce. All kinds of businesses are moving here. All kinds of people are moving here. As a matter of fact, when you go around this place, it seems as if there are more people from other states living here than from the state of Georgia. Yes. Corinth was a, was a popular seaport town. It stood just southwest of Ishmas of Corinth, the land bridge that connected northern Greece and southern Greece. This made Corinth, this great city, the, the, the crossroads for trade by land, north and south, as well as by sea, east and west. So those who traded by land had to go through current, and those who traded by sea had to go through current as well. And I indicated uh, previously to you that during those times when trade and businesses took place, it was not unusual for um, a businessman to spend um, a year in one place. And so the, 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 the church at current um, was made up of people from all walks of life. And so, um, even though we are not talking about tongues right now, but we can understand the confusion that existed in, in, in the Corinthian church over the matter of tongues. And it was a matter of language. And by the way, wherever the word tongues is used in the scriptures, it's about language. There has to be a language. And there was a language problem in the church at Corinth. But that was not the only problem. There was a communion problem as well too. Because people were bringing their own food to the communion. Everybody brought something. It was like a potluck. You know when you have communion, everybody, 
you know, bring in their thing. P this one bring pizza, this one. And, and, and it had become, instead of something that honors God and honors the Lord, it became a matter of confusion. There was also another problem. There was the problem of unity that Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians. Where people were saying, I am of Apollos, I am of Peter, I am of Paul, and, 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 and so on and so forth. And, and Paul had to address this matter. He, he said, I didn't die for you. Did I die for you? Last time I checked, I didn't. You don't belong to us. You belong to the Lord. Because when we start identify ourselves with human individuals, it leads to division. And so, the, the, the city of Corinth, as we get back to that, um, well, had wealth, and also a steady stream of travelers and merchants. And it also had vice. What is vice? V-I-C-E. Anybody knows? Have you ever heard that word before? Yeah. Bad stuff. Huh? Bad stuff. Are you saying the vice president? Like a tool. No. Oh, vice. good. good. There's, there, it's also a tool. There, there, it's a tool too, but it's it's bad stuff. <laughs> As he said, vice president. Have you ever thought of that? You call a vice president. <laughs> but 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 in that case, that's that's why English is such a difficult language to understand. Because we have one word meaning several different things. It can mean bad and it can mean good. It can mean evil. So we have vice admiral, vice president, vice all kinds of stuff. Yet we have the word vice, which means moral depravity. Moral depravity. And it also means um, wickedness, which involves prostitution and pornography, hmm. jobs, and smoking is listed there too, moral deprivation, bad habits, unhealthy habits. Sexual immorality. You know, um, I remember, and don't tell anybody, when I had just started preaching, and you know, um, I, I made a mistake with this word. Um, instead of um, um, saying sexual immorality, I said sexual immortality. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the men would love that. If I was in Africa, I'd be all good. But you see how words can get mixed up and mean completely something. <laughs> Sexual immortality. <laughs> oh Lord of mercy on us. But 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 that's what vice is. So although the city of current had become so wealthy and, and so populous and famous, and everybody was moving in like LA or New York or one of these populous cities, um Atlanta is becoming very popular now. Everybody's moving here and they're building up uh, businesses and, and setting up studios and, and the city is becoming more and more popular. But we know that within the heart of that city, there is vice. Oh, yes. And I don't mean vice president. He might be there, but... <laughs> vice. And so, having set this up, you, you can understand why eventually some of this evil that sat outside of the gates of the church finally seeped in. Because Jesus said, let the wolves and the sheep And 
the goat. Let the wheat, wheat and the tears. And so, moving into the, the church the, were these issues. Fornication. And one of the, the, the other reasons why current had become so corrupt is that prostitution had become a form of worship. They, 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 this is Greece we are talking about. So they worshipped to all these different, they worshipped all these different Roman gods. And they had a temple to Aph Aphrodites. They, they had these temples where you could go and worship. And prostitution was a form of part of that worship. Just imagine. So it was in the midst of this that God called Paul to raise, to, to give birth to the Corinthian church. In the midst of that corruption. And so as the church developed and grew part of the problem because you, you can't tell a man just because things are not so right with him or tell a woman because something is not right with her that you can't come to her church. They had all moved into the church. Some were members, some were not. But they were a part of the church and, and brought corruption within Incest was a problem in the church at current. You talk about problem in a church, you think you, you think you see anything yet? You just read about the church at current and you shake your head and say, How oh, on earth did they survive? Here, here, here's what Paul says in his first letter to the church at Corinth. Here are some of the matters that he dealt with. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 1 says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that even the pagans do not tolerate. So he was saying that there is immorality among you that even the, the, the Edens wouldn't tolerate. I wonder what Paul would write today. To some of these churches. If he had to write that over again. In the same chapter. Verse 9 following. He wrote. I wrote to you in my letter. Not to associate with sexual immoral people. And, and he's careful to explain this. Not at all meaning the people of this world. Hello. So he said, I'm not even talking to the people outside of the church. <laughs> I'm talking to you inside of the church. Because um, he says, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the, the greedy, or the swindlers, or the idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world. So he's saying, I'm not talking about them. Because if I was talking about them, then you'd have to leave the world not to associate with them. I'm talking about people in the church. Because you can leave the church, but you can't. You can leave the world, but you, know, you have to use a, a different transportation that you probably don't want to. We can drop you off at Mars and leave you there. And, and, and listen again. Listen, he says, he says, in this case, you would have to leave the world, but, verse 11, but I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone, listen, who claims to be a brother or a sister. He says, don't even associate with them, but is sexually immoral? Doesn't stop there, though. No? 
Greedy. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, this is something. Idolater. Or slander. Or junkard. Or swindler. In the church. Remember, we established that. That we're talking about people in the church. Says, says if, if you know that they are doing these things, don't even associate with them. Do not even eat with such people. So that when we have our little get together back there, we need to lock them out. If we know who these people are. Oh, that would be something, isn't it? Hey, brother, you can't. I am sorry, but this story is for. Oh, Lord. What, what, what trouble would we have um, here? And, and, and so Paul sets it up. For, for what had happened. He, he talks about, in chapter 6, he talks about sexual immorality. And, and the problem of sexual immorality right there in the church. First of all, he talked about lawsuits. That's, that's a message for another time. Because Christians had lawsuits against each other. And Paul says that's, that's immoral. But he says there's sexually Sexual immorality among the church. And now we are saying to people, we ought to accept everything. Paul says, absolutely not. You shouldn't even associate with anybody that is perverted. And again, he's not talking outside of the church. You get that? The people in the world, those are not the ones he's talking to. So don't get go home and say, Pastor, say I shouldn't associate with, with certain groups of people. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying within the church, if you know that people are engaged in certain kinds of behavior, you need to stay away from them. <laughs> you were serious about that. No joke about this. So if somebody is going to slander somebody's name, we ought to stay away from them and be careful. We ought rather to encourage. And so based on this, that is where um, Paul comes to in, in, in the lack of verses, verse, verse nine, verses 19 and 20, he says, he asks a question, a rhetorical question. He says, do you not know that you, your bodies your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. First quick point I want to make is that Paul is actually saying to, to, to the Corinthians, look guys, these things ought not to be named among you because you are under new management. You are under new management. <laughs> you see, when, when, when a company is bought, and those of you who are in business know this, when, when you have new ownership, things will change. Things have to be different because things now must be operated in accordance with the new owner. And a new ownership. So the first point I want to make here is to remind us that our bodies are under the control of the Holy Spirit. And there are three P words. And the first one is possession. We are possessed. You know they talk about people being possessed by evil spirit. We are or should be as believers possessed by the Holy Spirit. In that the Holy Spirit should, should, should dwell in us. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? The, you know, um, Brother Michael is always pr praying that this place 
is, would become um, WCIC, the church, and this place would become where a place where God meets with his people. Yes. And that's what I'm at some point. The, the temple was a place where God meets with his people. That was the purpose of the temple in Israel. You see, in, in, in most theological dictionaries, the temple and the tabernacle are used, the word temple and tabernacle are used interchangeably. So the, the tabernacle was where God meets with his people, but the temple was also where God meets with his people. The tabernacle was, in, was the center of worship of Yahweh by the people of Israel from shortly after the exodus until it was replaced by Solomon's temple around 960 B.C. The, the literary structure of the tabernacles of the tabernacle shows that the, the, the ultimate need of the, of the people was not for deliverance from physical oppression or from theological darkness, but from an alienation from God. That's what they needed to be delivered from. So God had to meet with them because the people, mankind, because of sin, because of the sin of Adam, had been alienated from God. They, they no longer meet with God. You, you remember when God, when Adam and Eve sinned, God came looking for them and searching for them. Adam, where are thou? From that very time, God has been searching for mankind and calling mankind back to himself. Where are you? Come back. Come back home. I want to meet with you. So the temple or the tabernacle was the place where God meets with his people. Yes. Amen. It was the meeting place. That's the meaning of, of the word tabernacle. And it was a reminder that God wants to meet with and have fellowship with his people. You see, in calling out Israel as a special people to himself, God also made provision wherein the nation could meet with the Lord. Jerusalem was known for its beautiful palaces which housed the great kings of Israel, such as David and Solomon. Psalm 48 and, and verse 2 tells us be, um, Jerusalem was beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. However, no matter how majestic the palaces were, they pale in comparison to the magnificence and the meaning of the temple of God that stood there. Wherever the people of Israel were, they would look towards the temple. They would pray towards the temple because they understood that in the temple was where God would meet with his people. However, Jesus came on the scene and one day he met with the woman at the well and, he's, and, and he told her, he said, the time is coming when worship will no longer be done in these temples or in these hills, but we should worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Jeremiah saw that happening. He says, one day, one day the time is coming when, when the, the Spirit of God shall dwell with man on the inside. On the inside, the Spirit of God would be with man. You see, the temple was also a reminder to us that, God's, that God wants to take a permanent residence in our lives. So, the, 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 while the tabernacle was a temporary thing, and even the temple was a temporary thing, and, and has changed hands now, because now God wants to meet with you and I. Mm -hmm. And he wants to take up permanent residence in our hearts. You see, you can't survive in this world without the power of the Holy Spirit if you're a believer. You need for the Spirit to take up residence in your heart. Permanent residence. 
in our hearts that God, you, you see, there was a time when, when Jerry, um, um, Ezekiel saw the spirit of the Lord leaving the temple of Israel. Because Israel had become so corrupt that, that the spirit of the Lord departed from Israel. But thanks be to God, no longer do we have to worry about that because the spirit now comes and takes up permanent residence in our hearts. Aren't you happy about that? Permanent residence in our heart. Don't you understand? Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. If you don't have the Spirit of God inside of you, you don't belong to God. This is not something you tire for. This is not something that you go at the altar and, and beat yourself up over. This is something that God gives to you the moment you repent and ask Jesus Christ into your life. The Spirit comes and takes up residence in your heart and lives. Don't you know that this was given to us by God. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Who is in you whom you have received. Here's what Matthew Henry wrote. He says this is the proper notion of a temple. A place where God dwells. And sacred is it is sacred to his use. So the fact that God dwells in you should um, make you a vessel of honor, should make you be, be, be a, his servant because he dwells in you. It is, he makes you be, to be able to be used of him because without his presence in you, you cannot be used of God. No wonder so many of us struggle with this because... We don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You see, God is not just interested in meeting with you. He's interested in abiding with you. I will abide with you. I will stay with you. Don't worry. I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Therefore, Paul was saying to the Corinthians, you should not defile the temple of God. You should not defile the temple of God. So, so he, he went on, he says, you are no longer in charge. You are no longer in charge. I like that. So here, we say that we are possessed, possession, and now we're talking about purchase. You have been purchased. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. price. <laughs> you were put on the auction block by Satan, to whom you were once a slave. Because when we fell into sin, we become slaves to sin and servants of the devil. So uh, we are servants of the devil from the moment we are born. We are born with, with a desire to evil. And so we, we, many of us, and we know it for ourselves because we have done our share of wrongdoing. Am I right? You, you have messed up, you have done some, some funny things, but thanks be to God. When, when, when he put 
the Satan put you up on the action block and you stood there. You were beaten up. You were bruised. You were hopeless. And, and, and you were hoping that somebody would come along to, to purchase you. Somebody just like a slave standing there waiting to be purchased and to be bought. You were hoping that somebody good would come along. A good master that would take care of you. But, but when um, the Lord stepped up to, to the auction, Satan asks for the ultimate price. He says, you, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to pay. Yeah? Pay with your blood. <laughs> God, Jesus said, that's all right. That's what I came to do anyway. Yeah. So you didn't, this didn't originate with you, but I'm here to pay with my blood. Whatever it takes, I can't let Michael die. I'm here to deliver him. I, I'm here. This is the purpose for which I come. So whatever it takes, I'm willing to do. I'm willing to pay. I don't care what the price is. I'm called. God sent his only begotten son so that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He came. You were bought with a price. Therefore, you are not your own. But, but in, in times of slavery, when a master buys a slave, that slave belongs to that master for the rest of his or her natural life. Yes. So when, what Jesus did for you is that he purchased your salvation and you belong to him. You see, Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, he says, The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, The person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeem us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. So Jesus took the curse that we were supposed to receive on his own back. He became a curse for us. And the Bible says, curse is everyone who hung on a pole. He redeemed us, verse 14, in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. By faith. We, he, we, we, he became a curse for us. The curse, the curse rather, was in effect of sin in separating us from God. Romans 6 verse 23, the wages of sin is death. God's holiness, folks, demands that the price must be paid for sin. Blood must be shed because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But the Bible tells us that there is good news for us because in verse 5, uh, verse 8 rather, of Romans chapter 5, the Bible tells us what God demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When? While we were yet sinners. You, you, you didn't clean up and come to him. You came to him like the song says, just as I am. Without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And as thou bids me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to the cross I cling. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What a price! What a price! Peter got in the act and in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness for the righteous, rather, for the unrighteous, <laughs> to bring you to God. That's the price, folks. That's, that's, that's the price he paid. We used to sing a, a, a chorus in church, redeemed. When my burden of sin was high, redeemed. Yeah. When my soul condemned to die, redeemed. For the price I could not pay, redeemed. Hallelujah, redeemed. The angels of heaven can't sing that song because they don't know what redemption is all about. They can only watch and see. But you and I who have experienced redemption know that a great price has been paid for us. Amen. Oh, the whole thing says he paid the debt he did not owe. I owe the 
debts I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debts on Calvary. He paid the price for you. One final thought and I close. And that's on purpose. Purpose. Purpose, folks. So we, we, we have possession. And we have purchase. And now we have purpose. And I know some of you have been talking about this early on. They were, we were talking about this early on. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Based upon the fact that he, he possesses you. Based upon the fact that he, he, he purchased you. You should glorify God. That's your purpose. See, all these people are talking about purpose. And I hear some of you making all these nice comments about purpose. But you know what the purpose of man is? To glorify God. So whatever you do, whether on the job, whether at home, your duty as a believer is to bring glory and honor to God. Yeah. So if you're doing anything that does not bring glory to God, you need to stop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what Paul was saying to them. These sexual immoralities, this corruption, the, the pornography that we engage in, and now it's on the internet. Kids can look at it. There's no restriction anymore. In, in our day, there are restrictions. Because if you do certain things, your parents would restrict you. They were the buffer. Nowadays, there's no buffer. Kids are left alone on their phones, on their internets. Everything is available. So our kids are becoming corrupt. Yes. There's no buffer. Pornography is everywhere. Sexual perversion is everywhere on the news. In, in, even in cartoons now, sexual perversion is presented. In, in every comedy on TV, sexual perversion. In every movie, sexual perversion is encouraged. Paul says... We should honor God with our bodies. Our bodies is not our own. It has been purchased by Christ. Therefore, he says, we should honor God with our bodies. Our bodies were meant to honor God, not to please ourselves by fulfilling our own lusts or desires. Take a note of this. The shorter, shorter, Catechism asks the following question. And you can look it up. Shorter Catechism. Gives you some good information there. Um, from way back when. What is the chief duty of man? You know what the answer is? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. You and I are here to bring glory to the name of God. You see, people who are delivered from slavery must demonstrate how grateful they are to the one who delivered them. If you have been set free from slavery, you need to be grateful to your deliverer. That your deliverer. Instead of incest and prostitution and other forms of sexual immorality, we should... Paul says, use our bodies to glorify and honor God. Let me ask you, are you using your time, are you using your body to glorify God? Because body includes using your talent and using your time to bring glory to God, to invest in God's business. In the workplace, in the street, at home, there should be a testimony to the fact that you have been bought with a price. You are not your own. The problem in our churches today, why people don't show up when they want to, is because they think they belong to themselves. I can show up when I want to. I can do, do what I want. They have all of these songs now. Do what I want. Live all I want. Do this. You see, you see, you see the, their uncertain spice. Everybody, they don't know what their purpose is in life. But your purpose, 
young people, young ones, teenagers, others here, young ones, your purpose in life is to glorify God. It's not to achieve the greatest in education. There's nothing wrong with a good education. But remember, first of all, first of all, KJ, if you stay awake here, we, your purpose is to glorify God. Because ultimately, that's all that matters. And we glorify God. So think about it, folks. Think about it today. So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Stand with me, please.